the Rose Bowl was an absolute movie. Alabama, Michigan going back and forth, came all the way down to the very final play in overtime. We'll talk about that final play here in just a second. But I want to kind of give a, a more uh, morning after sort of feel to it. Because like we said at the top of this thing, man, with, with more time comes more clarity. We are now a few more hours wiser from, uh, from this game. I want to start with Alabama. We'll talk about Michigan here in a second, but I think the real friction point comes with Alabama because I picked Alabama to win this football game. Hand up. We thought they were going to be the better team on that day. Now, are they the better team overall? The score would suggest not. I think the, the real issue, what went wrong for Bama, if you're asking yourself that question today, from a gameplay standpoint, I don't think they were anywhere near multiple enough to compete for a national title this season. And I was high on Bama throughout the course of this playoff, throughout the course of leading up to this playoff, really throughout the course of this season. We, we've been kind of standing by Bama and their talent level as a roster. But it became evident in this game with the way that they weren't able to push the ball downfield and the spots they found themselves in not protecting Jalen Milrow. It's not a recipe to stand on the mountaintop. Now, this team is still as talented as they need to be to win a national title this upcoming season. I fully believe that. I think that's always going to be the case at Alabama with how they recruit. But you can't average five yards in attempt, throw for less than 120 yards, and get sacked six times and expect to beat one of the best teams in the country, the best team in the country, according to those rankings in Michigan. It's just, you just can't do it. And so the task now going forward for Alabama, whether it's adjusting the game plan, whether it's getting in the lab and trying to adjust what they do schematically whether it's going to the portal and adding more weapons I don't know what it is but they were really good on the ground when they wanted to be when they were more decisive in that second half they got a good push up front but it was clear what they didn't have on third and seven if you're an Alabama fan I think you were feeling a lot of hoping and wishing and, and you know trying to you know visualize what could happen well on third and seven but that it wasn't the case. It was a lot of hoping. Instead of how I think Washington fans felt last night in the Sugar Bowl of like, hey, third and seven, cool. Who are we throwing it to? We live in third. We, we love third and seven. Alabama last night was not able to be successful in third and seven routinely. That was a big, big part of it. Uh, now, the last play. As soon as it happened, watching it live on my television, I was like, I cannot believe that was what they went with. Because at first glance, it looks like just quarterback design run, quarterback draw all the way. Holy smokes, what are we doing here? And if, if you're an Alabama fan, you're like, that's really the very best play we have drawn up. What actually happened in that play was it was a run pass option. Now, a lot of y'all are going to say, well, hey, no, Nick Saban after the game said it was a quarterback run. Just because he called it a quarterback run in the post game doesn't mean Jalen Middle didn't have a chance to throw that football. More on that in a second. Nick Saban's just not going to walk us through an RPO after having lost the Rose Bowl in the final play. I think that's pretty fair for him to you know, have that right. But what happened on that play was Jalen Milrow is reading the linebacker. That linebacker ran out with his running back. And so the option was, if he runs out with your running back, then you can follow your guard on a quarterback power and get north and south and try and get in the end zone. However, with the snap being low, Jalen Milrow wasn't able to see the full picture. In hindsight, he actually had both options there. The running back, even though the, the linebacker matched him, out leveraged him to the corner. So if Jalen Miro had seen that, maybe gets it out to his running back, maybe you get in the end zone. Again, this is all maybe, this is all hypothetical, but that was there. Now, even with the snap being low, the read from where I'm standing with the information that I have indicated he made the right decision to try and get north and south. The reason why it didn't work was the defensive lineman from Michigan did a great job getting across the tight end's face and blowing up that power play before it could happen. So the low snap obviously is going to get what, you know, the majority of the talking points. A lot of folks are going to say, well, hey, Tommy Reese, is that really the best call? I understand all that. Hindsight's 2020. Nick Saban said as much in his postgame press conference. If it had worked, it's a great call. It didn't work. So people are going to say it's a bad call. We didn't block it right. Nick Saban's telling you that. Now, going back to what I just said about people thinking this was a design quarterback run all the way. I disagree. That's first. Second, I would say go back and watch those wide receivers and watch how they approach those defensive backs. They're trying to get outside leverage. They're trying to capture that outside shoulder to get that edge for their running back should they throw the ball out there. 
If it was a design quarterback run, you would see them insert inside of them and try and wall them off from making a play on Jalen Moto somehow, some way. So the way that they were blocking every single thing about that play gives us an indication it was a run pass option. And also, just from a common sense standpoint, if you're Tommy Reese and you're not giving Jalen Moto a chance to also throw the football if he doesn't like the look running the football, I think it just sort of is a common sense thing that it was a good call by him to give him a little run pass option. Didn't work, so it's a bad call, but all that's to say, that was what happened on that final play. Now for Michigan, thoughts I have for them after this one, man. Like this, this was a leadership kind of win on a number of levels for them. And what I mean by that is Michigan made multiple mistakes physically throughout this game. You call them what you want to call them. You want to call them jitters. You want to call them lack of, you know, preparation mistake. Like whatever you want to put to it, that's fine. But there's a, like the bottom line is here, special teams miscues were very much so present yesterday. I mean, missed a field goal, missed a PAT. You had two muff punts, one that really hurt you, one that quite frankly could have hurt you a, a lot more than it did being recovered, you know, on the one yard line. But even with that being the case, they still found a way to overcome their miscues. And the reason why they were able to do that was twofold. Again, going back to leadership. They had a game plan there that in my mind was as good as it could have been for this game. You understood now, Jalen Milrow, he is a special, special player. His athleticism made him, I think, the best player on the field whenever he was out there. He gave you the most anxiety when he was back there. However, you understood, you couldn't just bring a bunch of pressure and bring someone from the third level because if he saw that, he'd diagnose it and get the ball out. Then you got a new set of problems with tackling Isaiah Bond on the open field. So what Michigan did really effectively was have stunts and twists from their defensive line to kind of manufacture pressure, meaning they didn't need to bring that safety. They didn't need to bring that boundary corner to try and surprise Jalen Milrow. It was confusing that offensive line and having them have issues passing off, you know, Graham or whoever you want to talk about there, and they got pressure that way. I understand that they brought a linebacker a few times or, or they would bring that in addition to the stunts, but overall, they weren't like trading resources on the back end to try and get home. And they got home again to the tune of six sacks. Anytime you get six sacks, man, you got to feel pretty good about your chances to win the football game. Also, the coverage beating pass game they had. Alabama, they've been a man coverage football team the entirety of the season. That is who they are. Cut them open, they're a man coverage football team. That's what comes out of them. Michigan understood they would have to have some answers in the pass game. Michigan wants to run the football. They want to be a sledgehammer team, but they would have to have something to attack Alabama when they played man coverage on, oh, I don't know, third and six, third and seven, whatever it ends up being. What they did was run a lot of crossing patterns, and Alabama in that first half did not have answers to that. Whether it was Colston Loveland, whether it was Roman Wilson, their ability to cross face and have guys go next to each other and sort of create that natural pick if you will that was huge for them early on and allowed them to hang around early in this game and ultimately win the football game so that game plan itself goes back to leadership goes back to preparation and having them be as ready to roll as possible we said it going into this one you would not see Michigan look like they didn't belong in this game kind of felt that way against TCU where they sort of got outside of themselves not in this game phenomenal game plan you go to leadership that's the first part the second part of this the poise of this team that goes back to leadership too. Jim Harbaugh, absolutely. But I think a lot of these guys that came back to win a game like this. Because listen, they remember that confetti dropping on them last year for the wrong reasons after TCU beat them. And all the punchline jokes around what they didn't do in that spot. Hey, that's great. You beat Ohio State. But hey, that's great. You won the Big Ten. But TCU took you down. And they lost 65-7 to in the national title game. So what does that say about Michigan? And I felt like... Maybe there was some anxiety. Maybe it was a game plan thing. Whatever you want to say, it wasn't present in this game. We asked, you know, or the thought, I guess, going into this game was, hey, why is this Michigan team any different than the last couple? Because I understand different guys from the year they lost to Georgia, but it's a lot of the same cats that were back from the year before the loss to TCU. Why should we expect them to have any different result that they didn't have last year? And the answer can be summed up in what they did that final drive to force overtime. They were zero flinch. I mean, absolutely none. They knew what the deal was. They knew what the assignment was. J.J. McCarthy making things happen with his legs, got the run game going, hitting Roman Wilson for a big pass to set up his eventual touchdown pass to Roman Wilson. Like, they were dialed in. There, there was no anxiety. There was no, I don't know how we feel about this. Why? Because they had been in moments like that before. 
They had been in Big Ten title games before. They had been in high pressure situations against Ohio State. They had been in spots like that in the college football playoff. And this time, they made it happen. They finished through the line. They had trained for that. They knew what that felt like. And when it came time to win, steady hand, they were good to go. They made it happen. So when you zoom out a little bit on Michigan, this is my last kind of morning afterthought when it comes to the Wolverines. If you're still stuck on the sign stealing stuff with Connor Stallions and company, like, I don't know what to tell you at this point. I don't, because like at this at this stage in the game, they have overcome every hurdle with a greater degree of difficulty. Like if Jim Harbaugh had stayed on the sideline for the course of this season, maybe this conversation is still going on a little bit. But at this point, like beat Penn State without Jim Harbaugh, beat Ohio State without Jim Harbaugh, beat a top four Alabama team. There's no sign stealing going on right now. If there was previously, it is what it is. I'm sure we'll revisit that with NCAA at a later date. But when it comes to just this season, there should not be any asterisk next to what they've done. And if you have an asterisk, when you look down at the legend for what the asterisk is for, it should be Jim Harbaugh then coaching six games. That's what the asterisk should say. So I think for Michigan, man, like, what more do you need to see to be convinced this is just a really good football team? All the thought that this was why they were good the last couple of years. Is it good to cheat? No. Did Michigan probably cheat? I happen to think so. But the thought around this always was, they have a lot of NFL players. And it's probably more so about that than whatever signs they did or didn't have. So that's just kind of the last thing I want to say here. I think that volume should be cranked down quite a bit. I understand we'll get to the NCAA investigation stuff when we get to it, but just so we're all aligned here, if, if you're still talking about signs dealing with Michigan, in the, in the context of this season, I, I don't know what kind of conversation we want to have about that. So it is what it is. Hey y'all, thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.